Hi there. Welcome to Simon Says, where you ask questions and I answer them. Let's take a look at the first one. It's from Melina. Melina asks, are there times where you shouldn't be optimistic? No, you should always be optimistic. But it's sometimes difficult to be optimistic. But the striving should always be to be optimistic. I can't think of a reason why we wouldn't want to be optimistic. Again, optimism is different from blind positivity. It doesn't mean it's the denial of difficult times. It's not naive. Um, we can believe that we're in a dark tunnel, but we can still stay focused on the light at the end of the tunnel. That's what optimism is. It's the belief that the future is bright. Okay, next question. Um, how, do you do, uh, how do you deal with career jealousy, asks Eric. Well, if you're jealous of other people's careers, that probably means that something's happening in your life that is tickling some sort of insecurity. So if you find yourself getting angry or jealous at somebody else's good fortune, the question is, is what, what nerve is it touching? What insecurity do I need to address? Also, if we take an infinite mindset, it doesn't really matter what anybody else is doing. I understand it's difficult. I suffer from it as well. We see people who are younger than us and making more money than us. It touches a nerve. It makes us feel insecure about where we are in this current state. But the hard work is to focus on ourselves, focus where we can improve, and worry about our careers, not about their careers. Okay. Um, Lee asks, where does the desire to learn come from? Well, I think it's innate. Um, I think that those that have a desire to learn um, believe that there is more to learn, that they don't know everything, regardless of how much success they have, regardless of how old they are, regardless of how wise they are. They just believe there's more to learn. There's an innate curiosity that there's more out there that they don't know. So can we teach people to want to learn more? That's a different question. I, I mean, the, opti the optimist in me says yes, but, uh, but yeah, it's the belief that there's always more out there. Okay, next one. Is there room for emotions in the workplace? Um, is there a way not to have emotions in the workplace? I mean, have you ever been jealous? Have you ever been insecure? Have you ever been angry? Have you ever been sad? Have you ever been frustrated? Has your boss ever said anything to you that made you feel like they're wonderful or they're horrible? Congratulations, you're human, you have emotions. For people who think that there aren't emotions in the workplace, then you're not human. I know senior, 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 senior executives who make decisions because they're afraid that the CEO might yell at them. That's called emotions. Um, the challenge is to be emotionally professional. The, that we cannot come to work because we're having a, a, a bad day or something happened in our personal lives and just sit there with our arms folded and be all grumpy and one word answers in a meeting. That's emotionally unprofessional. So there's absolutely a role, a role for emotional professionalism, but there's no eliminating emotions. Okay, Gene uh, asks, how do you create work-life balance with a remote job. It's really hard these days when our office is our kitchen or our living room. Um, and it's about drawing a fine line in the sand. Now, for better or for worse, we've been struggling with this for a long time. You know, the promise of smartphones was that we could leave the office. It didn't happen. We took the office with us. And so we've had to learn the strategies of disconnecting. Um, I think that's the same here. You need, to you need to create lines in the sand. So a certain time, work stops. What I find works for me is to physically close the computer. Right? I don't just leave it open and up. I physically close the computer, sometimes even put it away. Work is over. Um, if we leave it out, we can't help ourselves but to keep checking it. Same goes with our phones. Leave the phone with the computer, physically put them away, and focus on family or yourself. Next question. Okay. Uh, what if the thing you love to do isn't the thing you're best at, asks Michaela. <laughs> well, that's okay, as long as you derive joy from it. Um, the tricky thing is if you're really good at something you hate, because then you find yourself in a job getting paid for something you don't want to do. Um, if, if, you're, if the thing you love to do isn't the thing you're best at, I guess if you keep doing at it, you'll get better at it. Most things improve with practice. So if you love doing it, do more. You know you love it. Keep doing it. Okay, that one hit me in the face. Um, Ari asks, um, when do we need to be selfish? I think the time we need to be selfish is when we're doing things that are hurting us. So, for example, um, if we find ourselves never resting and working and working and working and working and working, 
Now you can be selfish. If you find yourself constantly saying yes to things or being there for somebody else to the point where you're making yourself sick, you need to be selfish. Um, I don't believe in the idea of, of martyrdom. I don't believe in the idea that you're constantly, constantly, constantly giving to others to the point where you destroy yourself. It's about finding the right balance. It's impossible. It's art more than science, but it's what it means to be human. Unfortunately, sometimes we have to be selfish, which means saying no. The funny thing that I've learned is that saying no is actually better than saying yes and then either not showing up fully or not being able to be there for somebody else. In other words, disappointing someone that we thought we could be there for, it's actually better to just say no. And I've learned to say no to friends and say, let me get, it, get to you at another time uh, or in work, same thing. And it's amazing. People are actually more patient and willing to work with me. So uh, do we, when do we need to be selfish? When you find yourself hurting yourself. All right. Uh, can you be a good leader, but a bad person? Asks Ellie. Uh, depends how you define bad person. But no, I don't think you can. Because inherent to being a good leader is to have concern for other people. And inherent to being a bad person, in my mind, is having no concern for other people. Uh, so uh, can you be a good leader and a bad person? Uh, no, I think you have to have empathy. You have to have patience. Um, a good leader wants to see those around them rise. A bad person puts themselves first, wants to see themselves rise, sometimes at the expense of others. However, being a good person can help you learn to be a better person. Sorry. Being a good leader can help you learn to be a better person. Um, what do you do when your employees won't listen? Or how do you make people listen? Asks Chelsea. Ooh, Chelsea. Okay. Um, what do you do when your employees won't listen? Is it your employees or is it the way you're speaking to them? Um, there's a wonderful little book called How to Talk to Kids So Kids Will Listen and Listen So Kids Will Talk. Yes, it's a parenting book. It's also a brilliant leadership book. I highly recommend checking it out, Chelsea. Um, very often I find that if somebody won't listen, I take a look at myself first and try different strategies. I've even asked other people to deliver the message for me because sometimes it's a personality thing. Sometimes the way I communicate is better received by some people and the way I, somebody I work with communicates is better received by others. So it's about trying different strategies. Um, also empathy. Um, maybe they won't listen because there's something going on in their lives that you're ignoring. Maybe they're under a certain kind of stress that you're just not paying attention to. So going up to them and saying, hey, I've been trying to connect with you and I'm really struggling. And so I just wanted to find out, are you okay? What's going on? That's a great way to get people to start to hear um, and for you to hear them. So how you get people uh, to listen, probably start listening to them. Okay. Valerie wants to know, what do you do when you feel overqualified for a role? Um, ask for more responsibility. Um, if you feel overqualified, um, you can ask to do more. You can also uh, offer to help others take on more responsibility, even informally. Um, you said feel overqualified because that, that's really interesting versus actually being overqualified. Um, uh, you can ask the person you work for and say, I think I'm capable of taking on more. Can you take a risk on me? Can you give me something more and let me see if I can do it? And you'll discover very quickly whether you feel overqualified or if you actually are overqualified. Yes, that is a plane flying over. This is live, guys. This is live. Okay. Uh, how can I work on myself while I'm self-isolated? Asks, uh, asks Amani. Um, well, the good news is self-work uh, doesn't require us to be out in the open. Um, there's many ways uh, for self-work. Um, one is reading, watching talks, getting strategies, but you can also call people and have Zoom calls and get coaching and ask advice from friends and help ask them to point things out to you. The most important thing is you can't really do self-work completely by yourself. It's kind of ironic when people say you need to work on yourself. It's not like you go off into the Himalayas and lock yourself in a cave and you work on yourself. I hear this in relationships all the time. People, you know, break up because my partner needs to work on themselves. Well, guess what? The best way to work on yourself is actually in a partnership, whether it's romantic or friendship or otherwise. So at least find a friend who wants to go on the journey with you. And the best way to do self-help is actually actually um, that you commit to helping someone who's actually struggling with the same things as you. In other words, you agree to help each other. Um, I always think that doing self-work is actually a team sport, ironically. All right. Um, why do we chase profit? Why is money and the, accumulation and the accumulation of it a top priority? Asks Alan. Well, 
partially it's our society. Our society has defined success by your car, your house, your bank account. It's unfortunate it's just the way we've gone. It doesn't have to be that way, but it is. We chase profit also because that's how uh, we're judged. We're judged in our companies very often by how much we produce, by how much we bring in. Um, we need to change the incentive structures. Um, we need to judge people by helpful, how helpful they are to others. Are they good team members? We need to find better balances in our society. And we probably all need to learn to be a little more Zen Buddhist and learn to disconnect ourselves from the material and find joy and happiness in our friends and the things that we do, in the experiences that we have, not just the stuff that we have. So I think it just takes practice and, uh, and a little change in our society, which then begs the question, how do we change our society? Change starts at home. Okay, is college a waste of time in today's world, asks Matthew. No, it's not. I know there's a whole movement against college. And one of the reasons there's a movement against college comes from people who've done extremely well, either while they were in college and dropped out, Mark Zuckerberg, Mark Zuckerberg, um, or had good fortune and didn't need the college. And so they stand up and say, you don't need college, I didn't need college. Well, that's true. Some people don't need it. But there's more to college than simply the, the subjects that we learn. Do we need the subjects in college? Not really. Most of the stuff we'll study in college we won't need in future, in our future, and it won't help us be successful. But we're learning more than that in school. We're learning how to interact with other people. For many of us, it's the first time we, we've left home. We're learning to fend for ourselves, do our own laundry, get a job, provide for ourselves, budget our money. That's a new one. Um, for many people, they're living in dorms. They're learning to interact. Uh, they're learning independence. They're learning self-reliance. It's also the first time in a classroom where your professors will expect you to disagree. In high school, largely you do as you're told. You take the test and that's it. In college, it's about discussion and it's about disagreement. And sometimes there are no right answers. So one of the things you'll learn is how to disagree, how to form an argument. There is so much more that you learn in college that will help you in the rest of your life that have nothing to do with the subjects that you're going to learn. In other words, choose is based on the quality of your professors, not based on how easy the classes are, or sometimes even just what the subject is. Yes, college still has value in our lives. Um, Elias asks, what's more important, depth of knowledge or breadth of knowledge? Depends what you want to do with it. Context matters. It's, it's, there's no such thing or right or wrong or good or bad here. If you want to do a job that requires breadth of knowledge, well, then that's more important. If you're doing a job that requires depth of knowledge, well, that's more important. There is literally no right answer here. What I would recommend is play to your strengths. Most people have a natural leaning. I'm a generalist. I don't necessarily have depth of knowledge in one particular thing, but I'm pretty go good at taking bits and pieces from all over the place. So guess what I've done? I've pointed my career in a direction where breadth of knowledge is actually a little more helpful. Um, but if it's a depth of knowledge thing where I have to go deep into the numbers and deep into the studies and all that, I fall apart. So if you have a natural leaning, try and point yourself to a job or a career that actually helps you work to your natural strengths. Thanks very much for all your questions. Thanks for joining me on Simon Says, the place where you ask the questions and I answer them. And please send more and we'll do another one of these. Thanks very much and see you soon.